Hello, Ben here. Hope you're well. And welcome to episode 32 of Benji's Cafe podcast. Joining me in Benji's Cafe this week is one of Great Britain's most decorated Paralympic skiers, Millie Knight. Millie started skiing when she was six years old, the same year she lost her sight. Millie made her Paralympics debut in 2014 in Sochi at just 15, becoming the youngest at the time GB Paralympic competitor ever. She then competed at the 2018 Paralympics, winning two silver medals and a bronze, and again in Beijing 2022, bringing home a bronze medal. World Downhill Champion with guide Brett Wilde, Millie has been nominated for both the Times' Young Sportswoman of the Year and BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year, and is now a keynote speaker, inspiring audiences on motivation and overcoming obstacles. In this episode, Millie shares her Paralympic success, the significance of her medals, and the importance of a can-do attitude. My school never stopped me from doing anything, um, which I think is quite important to my sort of character now, in that I don't really let much stop me. They could have completely and utterly wrapped me in cotton wool and not let me do anything. And I think that would have very much changed me as a person. I'd have become very cautious and I certainly wouldn't have achieved the things that I have achieved. And I think that sort of can-do attitude probably has helped a lot throughout my life. In, In every aspect, not just in sport. Millie is an honorary doctor of the University of Kent and in 2023 appeared in BBC's Pilgrimage, The Road Through Portugal. Oh yes, she's also Commonwealth and National Karate Champion. What a career, what a woman. Welcome to Benji's Cafe Podcast, Millie Knight. Good morning, Millie. How are you? Very well, thank you. That was that was amazing. That was fantastic research. <laughs> Uh, have you had a nice start to the day? It's a bit soggy here in Liverpool, but do you have a little a little routine to get you into your Wednesday? Well, now that it's a bit colder, um, coming into my absolute favourite months, uh, I can now start the day with a cup of tea, which is just lovely. <laughs> hey, well, a cup of tea is always good. I always go coffee first, and I'll have I'll probably have a cup of tea after this mid morning. Millie, it's so lovely to chat to you. I first came across you really in BBC's um, uh, Pilgrimage, which I thought was a wonderful program. Was that? an exciting um, experience for you, the the chance to kind of be free almost and just embrace all that beautiful countryside. Was that, was that a wonderful experience? You know, pilgrimage was, I have to say, one of the best things and the most incredible experiences of my life. You know, I've had the privilege of doing such fantastic things um, and I've seen amazing places and I've met some brilliant people, but pilgrimage was one of those experiences that I will never forget. And it's two years ago today, really. um, Wow. And I can't can't believe it's gone so quickly. It was, I was really apprehensive about doing it. It wasn't something that I was excited about. Um, I didn't really think it was, I mean, for a start, I was like, I'm not a celebrity. So (laughs) I'm doing this for like such a fraud. Um, I really can't put it into words, that experience, because... I'm I'm not a big walker. <laughs> I'm not the yeah. most religious person. Um, and like I said, I'm not a celebrity. So I was kind of like, mm, this isn't really for me. But from, I think, day one, when, when we met everyone, the crew, everyone was amazing. And I never thought that I would be on with such lovely people did it did it help having um a varied group of people to get along with like and also i'm really interested like how how much how much could you see millie uh, you know when you were walking did i know you had a brilliant relationship with your with your skiing partner brett but yeah. did you have to rely on the other participants to help you there as well yeah absolutely um it, everyone was so helpful without me even having to ask for help everyone just stepped in rita guided me basically the whole way um without me having to ask her it was just you know just out of her kindness um and it was it was a really nice experience because i was on there as millie as opposed to millie the athlete or any other sort of identity and it was kind of the first time where i was able to be me on camera without having to talk about my successes of sport or anything else it was um it, yeah it was so good it was so good <laughs> was that quite a, a, a scary thing a little hurdle to get over Millie would you say actually because it was away from from the sporting arena that you were known for absolutely it was so far away from anything I'd ever done before um 
I, I was very used to interviews and, and things like that, but they were very sort of structured, very, uh, <laughs> very clear, sort of, you know, highly edited. <laughs> Um, like me just sort of kind of going oh well that was a fantastic run you know we skied very well and yeah we won the medal and you know it was but this was honest it was true it was there was no hiding because having a mic on for nearly 24 7 for just under three weeks was yeah <laughs> it was tough but it was yeah so amazing what would you say was the overriding thing that you took from the experience when you got back you know back to your phones back to back to the uk back to the madness of life was was it that just the importance of that that calm would you say yeah i mean like i said i wasn't a walker and i genuinely thought that yeah. walking 364 kilometers or whatever it was um would be the hardest part but actually that the walking was really not very difficult in the end because although it was challenging what we were doing because we were all doing it together and we were all experiencing the same thing um we kind of pushed each other through and making those connections along the way through the challenging stuff through the difficult terrain and um wet very wet very windy very cold very hot days um really made made the experience it was a great watch i thought it was lovely and my goodness when i saw those beautiful um drone shots over yes. over the countryside there and yeah. that beautiful rural, rural park porch i was like oh that would be nice likewise yeah. i'm not a great walker but i love the outdoors and just how it makes me feel just that freedom and that happiness i love that can you can you explain how you're feeling um you've retired now but when you were flying down those slopes millie is it a feeling of of just complete freedom or you know is it that intense listening to brett and you know the skiing partner and and, and getting down there safely that you, you don't have time almost to appreciate that that sense of freedom yeah that i mean that is unfortunately the case really when we're racing yeah um you know we're just completely zoned into each other and and what was being said what we needed to do um when we when we were training or just sort of what we used to call free skiing when you, you know you're not having to go through any any gates yeah it's you know it is that sense of freedom um there's sort of no doubt in that and being able to ski down slopes at the speeds that we used to ski at was freeing it was an amazing experience you know, personally i will never experience those speeds in any other sort of mode of transport that i'm in control of um yeah so that that in itself was, was amazing um but obviously then when you add the competitive edge to it y yeah i was just very much focused on on brett <laughs> i'm so intrigued with that relationship with brett could you just explain the process of how you find him and also i guess the level of trust you had in each other i'm from a theater background million you know we trust each other on stage to have that support mm -hmm. and that communication but that's I imagine those elements were major in your relationship with Brett, especially, you know, when you, you're conquering the Paralympic world. Yeah, it was a such a unique partnership um, and one that, that developed and grew. It wasn't one that started at an amazing level of trust. Um, we yeah. really had to work on it. And to, to the point at the end where, you know, we were best friends, it was... Um, yeah a friendship that we will have for life regardless of <laughs> there being any snow um and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah it was it was tough for him initially because he'd never obviously done anything along those lines um and he was a fantastic skier in his own right and when when you're a sort of independent skier you, you know you're, you're thinking yeah. about yourself and your technique and the line that you're going to take but all of a sudden you've now got the responsibility of <laughs> a blind person from following you very quickly and quite close behind you that yeah ordinarily you know in any normal able-bodied skiing you would never have two people on a course that close um and going at those yeah. speeds so it is it is a really odd um situation to be in um but brett adapted to it so well i think due to his navy background he he already had that amazing communication yeah. responsibility and um and again ability in his own skiing so he adapted to it really quickly and really well you, you're a fantastic partnership um was who was your first guide because obviously he <laughs> wouldn't have been around when you first started when you no. first started skiing did um my mum was my first ever guide um 
because <laughs> I she love was, it. She was great. Um, and at the, at the time, I was. 12 13 um we didn't have any funding we didn't really know very much about the sport and uh, and yeah. i needed a guide and my mum was a very capable skier and so she she stepped in um and then as i sort of progressed and improved i needed someone with actual race experience um and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trial and error um I, I don't want to say i was you know a, a difficult person to ski with at all However, that was tied number nine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that's funny, but good old mum. Aunt Mum's fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. I won my first international medal with my mum, so um, you know. Oh, amazing! Now you, you're you're from Kent, Mill. I used to live in Kent as well. Um, as far as I can remember, it's quite a flat county. Um, so how how the hell did you get into skiing? It was just uh, through family ski trips. Um, yeah. Really, my family were big skiers, um, and uh, when when I was losing my sight, uh, obviously the doctors <laughs> were talking to my mum, and they said, "You know, Millie's going to be losing her sight." Um, and I, yeah. <laughs> I think my mum's first response was, uh, "We've got a ski trip booked," <laughs> <laughs> and you know. I went on that and I loved it, absolutely loved it. Because at the time, I was pretty useless at most school sports. Um, yeah. They all seem to involve a ball. And obviously, if you can't see very well, trying to catch and throw a ball is not the most effective thing. Um, yeah. And so I just thought I was rubbish at sport. Um, I wasn't terribly academic at the time either. So yeah. I was just kind of, you know, plodding along. And then I found skiing and all of a sudden I wasn't plodding along. I was zooming along at great speeds and, and doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> and was that quite hard at school, Millie? Did you, did you have support from, from your friends at school and teachers? Or, or did you feel like, did you feel a bit ex- excluded from certainly the sporting activities that, that, you, that you could participate in at school? I should have felt excluded. Um, mm. I don't know... I, yeah, I'm not sure if I was a PE teacher, I'd put the blind girl in goal in hockey. Um, <laughs> but I did. Um, you know, my school were amazing and, and they let me do everything. Um, oh, there was, that's fantastic. There was literally nothing my school stopped me from doing. Um, I mean, a couple of times I ended up in hospital. But, you know, you learn from those experiences. Um, but, you know, like I said, <laughs> I, I played goalie in hockey, a goal shooter in netball. Needless to say, we didn't win very often. But, you know, I, I, I tried and, and my school my school never stopped me from doing anything, um, which I think is quite important to my sort of character now in that I don't really let much stop me. Um, there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to do it. Okay, driving, I can kind of see why I shouldn't do that. Um, isn't, that isn't that lovely, though? That must have built your confidence you know, from a young age as well, especially heading into your, your later sporting career, Millie. Mm. And it's so important, isn't it, for children just to feel accepted and just to have that confidence kind of um, kind of massaged as well, especially at a young age. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, it, they could have completely and utterly wrapped me in cotton wool and not let me do anything. Um, and I think that would have very much changed me as a person. I'd have become very cautious and I certainly wouldn't have achieved the things that I have achieved. And I think that sort of a bit of a cliche, but that like can do attitude probably has yeah. helped a lot throughout my life in in every aspect, not just in sport. Yeah. And do you remember you, you lost your sight at, at, at six? Was it a, a gradual process, Millie? How, can you even begin to navigate that, that at that age yourself? Not at all. I don't, do you know, I don't remember the time even vaguely. Um, mm. You know, I have many surgeries. I have, thousands of hospital appointments and I maybe I'm just a bit thick but I don't remember (laughs) you know my mum never made a big deal about it it was just you know oh well (laughs) you know there's there's worse things to happen and and actually losing my sight I will say is the best thing that's ever happened to me um I'm so grateful for it because the the things that I've experienced and the opportunities I've had I would never have had if I'd have had sight um my life now is really exciting um every day is a bit of a mystery 
um, as are the hidden steps everywhere. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are so many benefits of, of being visually impaired. It's great. You know, I get to skip the queue at various events. Um, <laughs> and it, there's, it's, it's great. I can definitely recommend. <laughs> your, your spirit, Millie, is... Honestly, it's so infectious. Do you realise how how much you inspire people, Millie? Or is it literally? Oh, this is just me. I'm just I'm just living my life. But you really you your energy and your spirit and confidence. It, it's really infectious. I think it's wonderful. Oh well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. I don't no. I don't, I definitely don't go about my life thinking. Oh, I'm a, I'm an inspiration. And, mm. But I I would just like to show that things are possible and that just because you have a disability does not mean at all that you can't do things. You know, I never thought that a blind person could do karate, um, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Your life is amazing. I'm, 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 I'm blown away. Um, so you, you had family skiing holidays and that progressed into the, and then the British development um, ski team. Is- yeah, absolutely. So I was too young um, to actually start racing. So I think I joined the team when I was 12, um, wow. and 13 to start racing. So I had a year of just training, which was amazing. I remember, I remember the first time at the end of my first training week, they referred to me as an athlete. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. That oh, I- that is cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Um, and, uh, and I, yeah, that kind of kick-started my career. And like I said, first couple of races with my mum, we did we did well. Um, I think we showed some potential and people um, believed in me. And, and, yeah, and a couple of years later, I'm skiing at my first Paralympic Games. Oh, that's amazing. How did that feel? You were flag bearer as well, weren't you? Was that just like from 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 school from family ski holidays to representing your country at the Paralympics and carrying the flag it must be like wow like what what an adventure do you know it was it was crazy I mean that is genuinely the only way I can explain it yeah um I remember being at the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Paralympic Games and you know I was 13 at the time um and it was my very first exposure to Paralympic sport to to anyone with a disability, really. You know, I was in a school yeah. where I was the only person with an impairment, um, so I didn't know anyone else. I didn't I didn't know anything about para sport and going to the Paralympics and sitting in the stadium and watching all the athletes with similar impairments to me walking out carrying flags of their country and. Um, on on the world's biggest stage was such an eye opener for me. Excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I just remember sort of sitting there going, I want to do that. I I want to be carrying the flag and representing my country. Um, and yeah. then to be asked to be the flag bearer at the opening ceremony of Sochi was just yeah. And did did they give you any flag lessons? They give you a little yeah. tutorial because I'd I'd be well up for giving it some fancy swooshing. And it's just like, there you go, good luck. I mean, they did, and they were like, just just follow the people. They're going to give you directions when you get out there. And it's like, oh, good day. This is going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Millie. We we were under the stage, so yeah. we we weren't actually in the stadium. Oh, before wow, okay. we came out and so I had no idea how big the stadium was mm. and <laughs> when you watch back the footage of me walking out with the flag I am terrified because I had no idea that it was a 55,000 seater arena and oh, everyone was really screaming and shouting and yeah I just I just looked terrified because I'm like I don't know where I'm going <laughs> <laughs> and when you've Obviously, that's that's quite soon, isn't it? You're 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 racing quite soon after an opening ceremony. You've done all your prep, of course, but is there? Can you actually enjoy those moments in an opening ceremony, Millie? Because or are you just so in the zone that you're probably months and months before have geared up to competing in that in that particular tournament, that particular competition. Can you actually embrace that situation, or is it just like, oh, you know what? The reality is, let's get this done. I'm I'm here to race tomorrow or the next day. You know, yes, because I was a very, very young, naive 15-year-old who was just absolutely ecstatic to be there. Um, I remember just looking around kind of going, this is amazing. This is so cool. Um, In Sochi, we had an actual Olympic village. It was a village complete with a post office. And 
I was just blown away by absolutely everything. I'd never competed at such a high level on such a big stage. Um, and I was just delighted by absolutely everything. Um, and uh, competing was almost secondary. You know, I was like, this is just an amazing thing to be in. <laughs> We're lucky to be here because my chances of being selected are tiny, 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 tiny. And I had yeah. very minimal preparation going into the games because I just did not think I was going to be selected. Everyone was telling me I wasn't going to be selected. So it wasn't just my sort of naiveness. It's just that yeah. it was the fact. It's like I wasn't going to be selected. And then all of a sudden I qualified. Um, wow. And it all happened really quickly. And so I was just kind of going, well, I don't want to come last. That's, they're my aspirations for these games, so. I love the fact that when you were 15, you were carrying the flag for Great Britain at the Paralympics. I was probably in the queue for Police Academy 4 at the Odeon in Sutton Coalfield, so. Um, and then you go on to win Paralympic medals. How is that? I mean, my goodness, I can see you have a few medals behind you. I don't know, do you have a um, Paralympic medal with you that we could have a look at? Yeah, in my Tupperware box. Oh, <laughs> If your Emily has her medal in a Tupperware, is it nestled between a cheese and pickle on granary? <laughs> uh, a teaspoon, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and some, and some blue oh wow! Medals I love are, it. Um, and if they clink together, they dent. Um, um, but this was this was my first Paralympic medal. Oh um, my goodness, Millie! Look at that. And it weighs about a kilo. Um, really. Yeah, and it's covered in dents. It is so damaged. The ribbon is completely a d different color. It's frayed. It's coming apart. But that's how I like it. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever want them to be tucked away in a glass box. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Think... You must be. You must be so proud. It must be lovely to to show people to remember that that experience for yourself and to share that with others. Like just seeing it there, it's like that that embodies so much hard work you put into the sport, hasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there there is a lot of hard work that goes into those Paralympic medals, but most of it was from the input of other people and, and the team around me, whether it was my coaches, physios, Brett, my mum, sponsors, you know, it, I'm just a very small cog in that wheel. Mm. Um, and like I was saying about London, it's, there were so many other people that inspired me and I was very much the generation um that was inspired by London 2012. And I think it would be very wrong of me now that I've achieved the success that I have to keep those medals in a glass cabinet um, for no one to see. I think that would be very wrong. And having my medals dented um, and frayed and sort of not in a pristine state is, it makes me happy because it's, those medals have been round to, the next generation um yeah. and hopefully i can be the that generation um yeah i can help inspire them maybe oh and is it wonderful when you, you you are meeting the younger generation they they see your medals and you you know they know your achievements Millie. that it must be lovely to, to think you know what if this if this inspires them even even to be confident even to to drive to do what they want to do in life that that's wonderful isn't it mm -hmm. exactly and some you know I go into many many schools and specific, yeah. some schools with um, specific units for people with visual impairments and and stuff like that and I just more to the point I want to make people aware that like a disability isn't an excuse it's yeah. it's not a reason to not do something you can't blame not being able to see for not doing things I mean I definitely yeah. did use it out of cross country at school but <laughs> apart from that you know. <laughs> You can't always just use excuses. And I remember so vividly a teacher at school said to me, and this quote has like been ironed onto my brain because yeah. it hits so hard. Um, you can either have good excuses or good results, but not both. And I just thought that is amazing because I think I'd obviously given some awful excuses to why I hadn't done homework. And I just remember thinking, wow, that you could translate that into every aspect of life. Um, and that's kind of something I've lived by um, for, you know, the last nearly 10 years. Yeah. Do you ever, have you ever experienced any prejudice like in the skiing world against you or in, in the sporting world? Now, now you're karate, in karate, the karate world. And if so, does that, 
how does that make you feel? Does it is it like an inspiration? Just like you know what, sod you, I'm going to use this as motivation. Yeah, it, unfortunately, you know, in the post 2012 era, people's awareness of the Paralympics is significantly more than it was. Yeah. Um, Paralympians are becoming household names, <clears throat> which is a huge, huge step forwards. But unfortunately, there still is that huge disparity between able-bodied sport and Paralympic sport. Um, significantly underfunded compared to the the able-bodied sports. UK sport is and has been amazing at bridging that gap. Um, that Paralympians and Olympians have, have funded the same through UK sport. Um, but people's attitudes, it still has a very long way to go. Um and, you know, even like looking at the prize money, for instance, I think in my entire skiing career, I won 600 euros of prize really? money. Um, whereas like the able-bodied uh, World Cup athletes will win 100,000 euros in one event. Um, you know, and, and I understand that I'm very realistic and, and understand that there is a huge, huge demographic of people that want to watch able body skiing. Um, and there's a lot more funding and media interest and publicity into able body skiing. So I understand why there's a difference there, but it is, it is a very visible difference. Um, and yeah, it's mainly from attitudes um we have a you know when we would win world cup medals um and world championships and stuff it was kind of like oh that's cool but this other person came 37th in a yeah and that's more exciting um and but that, yeah, that must have been hugely frustrating though millie yeah and i think it deep down there's something inside me that always kind of goes oh you're only good because you're disabled and people only think this is good because it's like, no, oh, that's sweet. She look at what she's doing and she can't see. That's so sweet. You know, there's there's oh. that kind of element to it, and and that is felt very deeply throughout kind of my career. Um, yeah. That like I'd only be in this position because of my sight, and I know I've said already in this podcast that I am in this position because of my sight. But I, yeah, it's something I'm very aware of. Yeah, well, I think with you with you championing it, Millie, then let let's just hope that predicament improves, especially for the, the new generation of Paralympic athletes coming through. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I I'm very privileged in my position that I've had very very minimal sort of um, uh, any hatred or or bullying or anything through through my life. Um, whereas I know some many people are. Um, but let's just hope that the next generation don't have to experience it at all. And now, and now, looking back at your at your skiing career, Millie, was it was it a difficult decision to retire from that? And was there is there a strange kind of void when you've made that decision? Yeah. So I um, I, I have many injuries throughout my career, um, most of which were concussions. Um, which I wouldn't wish upon anyone. I'd oh, rather lose more goodness. sight than have another concussion. <laughs> um, and uh, I, yeah, I really damaged my leg um, uh, at the end of or oh, the beginning of Beijing. That was that took a long time to heal. Um, but I mean, physically, physically, obviously, that that took a long time to heal. But I think the the repercussions of all the concussions and injuries and stuff mm. it, it takes a psychological toll um and you've kind of got to realize at some point like what cost does skiing have on my body and and my future and Gosh. i think I, I, I took a year out of skiing after my leg um and that kind of gave me a glimpse into what retirement would look like um, without the label of retirement, um, I, I I got a job, I started university again, um, and I was kind of like, okay, this is this is possibly doable. This is, yeah, I'm missing skiing, but I think normality and real life is is cooling. There's only so many years that you can put off an actual career. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, Millie, yeah. I, I'm an actor. I'm, I'm still doing that. I'm 50 next year. <laughs> oh, well done. You're a pro. Oh gosh, well, that's um, that's debatable. 
at the moment we're just a, a feeling of like yeah I've got to kind of make some foundations now for the, the next stage of my life yeah exactly and it was that sense of sort of acceptance and peace with the idea um yeah and there was kind of that relief when I did first announce it it was like okay this is this is cool you know I'm stepping into the next chapter and new era of my life um we're now almost exactly a year from retirement announcement and it's a very different feeling to last year last year I had this sort of euphoria and the the novelty you know that sort of honeymoon phase of this is really cool you know you're still quite current because you've only just retired and yeah now and now it's very different now it's kind of like you're in that morning phase of like the life that you used to have the the support you know because everything everything go everything stops instantly everything stops really Um, yeah wow and so it's quite a shock you know the first couple of months you're like oh this is nice this is cool you know I don't have to go away for long periods of time and but now it's like oh wow you know I don't think you you realize how lucky you were until you're out of that situation um uh, and then it hits home that's a, a, I think that's a really good point that it just goes to show to whatever you're doing in life to squeeze every drop of enjoyment out of any experience yeah 100% and because skiing was basically all that I knew from the age of 12 yeah. well, the age of 6 technically but for, for on the GB team since I was 12 and so that was that was 12 years of my life that had been all consuming to skiing and I, I did I loved it I genuinely loved it but, you know, there are times where you're kind of like, oh, I've got to get up at four o'clock and it's, yeah. you know, I'm going to burn 6,000 calories today because it's... God, but, that's but actually, crazy. Like, back, you're like, I got to experience that. I I, I had those opportunities. I, I saw sunsets that I'll never see again and, um, yeah, meet people that I'll probably never see again um, because they live the other side of the world, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the the phase of mourning that's quite difficult at the moment. And I'm kind of like, what can I fill that with? Ah, oh, karate. <laughs> <laughs> had, do you always had like a slight interest in that sport or was it suggested to you? Was it was it just like a really, really good sort of like energy release for you? Yeah, when I was at university, um, sort of briefly between skiing camps, um, yeah. My friends at the time did loads of karate and they were like, come on, come and have a have a try. And I was like, you look ridiculous. This is the most <laughs> good sport. You look like you're swatting flies. Um, they were like, you can't, you can't mock it until you've tried it. <laughs> wow, yeah. It's the hardest thing I have done. Oh, it was so, much, so difficult. And my sort of, sort of like laughing at them turned into admiration. Um, and yeah, since then I've been doing it religiously um and it's just turned into a lot more than it was meant to be yeah but that's great that must be your your olympic spirit just chucking yourself into something and then just getting that hook again just that buzz of of yeah. exercise of of committing to a sport committing to an environment it must be must be wonderful to have yeah absolutely it was great so i came back from beijing in the march yeah um recover from broken leg and then, <laughs> oh, this sounds so bad. This is <laughs> I love the fact you're laughing at, you just said recovering from a broken leg. I'd be in yeah. tears, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the timelines kind of don't really work out very well on this. Um, <laughs> and then I won the English National Championships in April and then was selected to represent England for the Commonwealth in September. Goodness. Um, and, you know, I hadn't done many karate competitions. I was still a newbie, really. You know, I'd been doing it for quite a few years at that point, but yeah. I was still essentially a newbie. And um, I, I trained really hard for it. I'm not just trying to underplay it, but um, to then win two golds at the Commonwealth was mental. Yeah, I remember just, like, performing, and, and that was that was fine. I was kind of nervous, but, you know, I'm quite used to that. Um yeah. And then waiting for the results, I was shaking like no tomorrow. <sighs> um, 
Yeah, so that was that was an amazing experience, you know, within six months going from a winter sport to a summer sport. Um, yeah. And you must give so much pride to your, you know, your family and friends. Is is that support mechanism important for you to give you that sort of buoyancy to, to, to pursue those those dreams? Yeah, hugely so. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to achieve any of this without their support. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. Um, it's It's weird moving into this new world in karate because... They don't necessarily, because I've retired, they don't know me as a skier. They know yeah. me as Billy. Um, and so it's a bit weird with my identity at the moment, because obviously my whole life was Millie the skier. Yeah, Millie the sure. athlete. And, and now it's like, oh, wow. So I've got this whole network of people in my life now that don't know me as Millie the skier at all. Um, and and that's quite cool. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah re-identifying myself and yeah i was going to ask you that must be weirdly quite a nice thing that you you know they're, they're treating you for how you are in, in the in the present that must be quite nice after you know so many years of being affiliated with with another sport mm, absolutely uh which is which is really cool and i think that that's helping the kind of the process of dealing with retirement and stuff but also it's it's quite difficult because it's like oh wow they don't know me as that person at all like that is a really closed chapter now which i don't i don't want it to be i'm not yeah. ready for, for that to be closed yet um so it's yeah it's a difficult one sort of mentally but i think you're wonderful and my goodness we can see all your medals i don't think you've got any room for any more you're gonna have to move house aren't you millie i've got a storage unit <laughs> <laughs> um I would love to ask you, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, your injuries and coming back from injuries. Yeah. You must have had to dig quite deep um, during those periods, Millie. I just wondered if you had any just little nuggets that, you know, life life can be difficult sometimes, can't it? But just little nuggets that you would use to somebody who's just a bit overwhelmed with life at the moment. That's a good question. I And something that probably I need some help with too. <laughs> um, right. So, like, I, I mean, when I was going through all my injuries and stuff, psychologically, that was the hardest thing. Physically, I had stepping stones and there were targets to meet. And it was very sort of, well, in theory, it should have been very linear. But psychologically, the, yeah. there's there's not many markers that you reach. or And it is and it is hard. And, and I think it's it's about reminding yourself of, of the goal and why you're doing this and who you're doing it for and... um kind of almost bringing yourself back down and grounding yourself um, rather than getting too het up and, and stressed about what could happen. It's like my sports psychologist always reminded me about like the controllables and what you can control. Um, and if you can't control them, you there's no space in your brain to worry about them. Um, yeah. So that, that was very much something that helped me get through and not not only in the in the bad times you know this, this my sports psychologist helped me amazingly and very frequently in the good times too because you've got to be grounded whether it's a bad time or a good time um whether it's a success or a failure you've just got always got to remain grounded and if you have that grounding you just your life is on a balance isn't it you've just got a good plateau to to cope with life even better i think yeah absolutely and it's like I feel very underqualified to give any form of advice. Um, at the age of twenty-five, mm. I feel like, you know, I've I've still got an awful, awful long way to go and a lot to learn. And I very much felt that when I was trying to give my speech for my uh, honorary doctorate. <laughs> you know, I was I was seventeen, eighteen at the time. God. <laughs> and I was having to stand and give a, a a very sort of articulate speech about, you know, advice that I would give to these amazing graduating um students and i was like i'm so underqualified to give any <laughs> advice here <laughs> it was more of a daunting experience than competing in the in the olympics Absolutely, i was terrified absolutely terrified <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm sure you are wonderful. Millie, it's so lovely to chat to you. I'd love to ask all my guests in Benji's Cafe podcast, what's on the dinner menu tonight? Do you do you enjoy cooking or who who's who's rustling up a nice bit of grub tonight? Oh, that's a oh, that is a good shout. Um I, food is very much a motivation for me. <laughs> oh, so uh, Millie, I, I blooming I, love it. I definitely have a better day knowing that I've got good food later. <laughs> my family uh, are butchers, so uh, Oh, it's yeah, good good meat and 
um, nice. anything, anything along those lines. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, that honest. sounds good. And I guess you need, I guess the, with your training as well, with the karate, that's important, isn't it? You need some, some good old energy there before a training session, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Millie, thank you for popping into Benji's Cafe podcast. You you are so inspiring. Your attitude helps so many people. And congratulations on all your success with your skiing career and now moving into your karate career career i think i think it's just wonderful and honestly keep keep smiling because you you make a lot of people happy and thank you so much for joining me in benji's cafe podcast thank you very much for having me thanks for listening to benji's cafe podcast with the inspiring millie knight make sure you hit follow so every episode gets sent straight to your phone tell your friends tell your family And if you can, please leave a review. No booking required and a brand spanking new episode every Tuesday. Just find us wherever you get your podcasts. In episode 33, I'm joined by the Good Life Gardener, columnist and presenter, Aid Sellers. I'll get the camera. Have a great day.